Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Jean Bové. She's an assistant professor at the Department of Psychology at Northumbria University. Her work has covered various topics such as parent offspring conflict over mate choice, variation in feminine beauty standards through history, sexual selection on age at menopause, and mate preferences for homogamy in facial features. And we're going to talk about those topics today. So Dr. Bové, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So let's start with uh, female attractiveness. So from an evolutionary perspective, what would you say are, is the rationale for understanding where it comes from, how it has evolved, and so on? So if that's okay, I'm going to try to define a little bit female attractiveness mm -hmm. because uh, I realized that actually people were not talking about the same thing all the time. And so sometimes it was creating some, some kind of confusion. I mean, I'm pretty sure you're talking about the same thing as I do. But uh, the thing is, some people, when they hear about female attractiveness or female attractiveness or female beauty, they have a, a larger concept. And you can put a lot of things in it. You can put, um, well, made, pref made preferences. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about but also the art and uh, other women's preferences and fashion and uh, and yeah many many other things and um in my field or at least in my research it's really really restricted so i really look when i talk about female attractiveness is it's about men's preferences preferences and about and for a sexual partner so it's it's really narrow and it's uh, almost boring. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah. And when I'm asking men about their uh, opinion about female attractiveness, I'm not going to ask them to write an essay about beauty, for example, which will be really interesting but hard to analyze as well. And I'm going to show them pictures of women, uh, and it's going to be bodies with without clothes, for example. Uh, so yeah, it's and really controlled and in a sense it's a bit boring, but also I like it because uh, when we do science, it's actually nice to have something really narrow because you know what you're talking about and you can control all the other things. So yeah, when we talk about this definition of female attractiveness, really restricted, which is what do men find sexually attractive? Um, so then the rational the evolutionary rational is a bit simpler to 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 explain and it's going to be uh that um well as individuals we're going to try to find a mate uh and the the, the goal the evolutionary goal is to try to increase our reproductive success so basically the number of descendants that we're gonna uh, transfer to the next generation. So it includes different things uh, like uh, trying to stay alive and then be able to have different uh, children. And you also want these children to be of good health so they can survive themselves um, and have uh, children of their own and, and, and so forth. Um, but yeah, and. So yeah, and so if we talk about men's preferences, uh, from an evolutionary point of view, you have different models, different evolutionary models to explain uh, the evolution of these preferences. I believe that the main one, when we talk about men and women, is the model of direct benefits. And it's uh, meaning that it's going to be trying to find a mate that will uh, be able to produce a lot of descendants and of uh yeah and of good quality uh if i if i may say uh, then you have like other things like indirect benefits that are more linked to uh, the the genome or the genes of the offspring themselves but that we talk about that a bit less when we talk about men preferences um and you have also like the fisher runaway you have o o other models but it's it's less present in this uh, in this field yeah 
So what are then the parts of the female body that men tend to pay more attention to and the ones they evolve to prefer the most? Um, so, so for the first part, for uh, what they pay attention to, uh, it's actually a bit more difficult than you would think as a question. Uh, so you have like nice techniques that are called um, eye tracking techniques that allows you to, to follow the gaze of, um, of participants. And it's nice because uh, when you ask people directly, what are you looking at when you're looking for a mate? Well, really often they don't know, or they're gonna lie because they're feeling comfortable telling the truth, but mostly they don't know. And most of our gaze patterns are quite unconscious. And so you don't really realize which part you're paying attention to. And so that's why uh, eye tracking techniques are quite nice for that and give us kind of a more objective um, uh, a view of what people are looking at or paying attention to. Um, and so when you do that, uh, it's not very surprising probably, but you can see that men are going to look at the face of um, a female body and, and the torso, uh, including uh, the breast and uh, the hips uh, and the waist. They don't spend too much time, for example, on the arms and the legs uh, when you show a stimuli of uh, female bodies. Uh, so yeah, okay, not, not very surprising, but it's nice to like have, have confirmation of, of that uh, using more objective techniques. Um, then of course, you know, it's, it, it's really artificial because you are in a lab, you are uh, looking at a computer screen with really standardized uh, bodies and you have something recording your, your eye movement. Uh, so then you can yeah, wonder if, if that would be the same patterns if you're just uh, walking the street and, and, and looking at people. But still, I, I would be really surprised if we would see that men are only looking at feet, for example, um, a woman in the street. I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible, but I would be surprised. But that would probably be mostly the face uh, in part also because we are using the face for other things that make choice, um, and so it's just uh, automatic uh, thing that we do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let, let me ask you then. But why is it that men evolved to pay attention to these features specifically? Well, I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, what is the kind of information they get from them that is evolutionarily relevant? So. So we think that uh, logically they should pay attention to uh, features that will give them information about the mate value. Uh, now it's easy to say, but now to define mate value is more complicated. Um, and uh, in, in in a feature like the face, you will have like a lot of information. Like it's it's going to be quite complicated to list everything, but. Um, yeah, if you look at body shape, uh, we think it's a bit easier, although recently we realize it's not actually that easy. Um, but uh, I'm sure you heard of, about the, the waist hip ratio. Mm -hmm. That is something that we uh, talked a, a lot about in this in this literature. And um, and yeah, and, and people think that is giving you good information about the mate value. Um, so for now, we're going to say that, yes, the waste repression is indeed linked to the reproductive potential of uh, a, a woman. I don't know if you want me to <laughs> explain exactly how now, because it's changed a bit uh, in, in the past year, but things we, we, we learned. But uh, uh, yes, basically, um, the ability of, of having a lot of healthy children. Yeah, since we've already, we're already touching on the waste whip ratio, then let's talk a little bit more about it now. Um, yeah. And as far as I know, there are different hypotheses out there to try to explain this preference. Uh, is there one that is the most supported or I mean, is or is it that at least for now, we're still not sure about what's the correct explanation for it. Uh, I think we still need a lot of data, but uh, 
so yeah, so before it's, it's been a while that we are saying that the way three pre show is is linked to to the made value, but people were not defining made value. So I I did a systematic review to try to see what exactly people were thinking about when they were talking about the waste repression and made value. And most people were thinking about health and fecundity. So fecundity, it's like just one part of fertility, which is just the ability to become pregnant just mm -hmm. at this uh, uh, instant. Um, and, uh, and so when you look at, at the data or at the theory, it's not that evident. So, so the waste repair show is indeed linked to health. And uh, doctors are going to use the waste repair show sometimes to see if you are at risk for some disease. The thing is, all these diseases that are linked to the waste repair show, they're actually uh, happening only in uh, older people, so mostly after 50 and almost never before 30, which is a problem because when we talk about this made choice and this made value, what we care about is at the age of reproduction, right? And if it's something appearing later, it's not going to be uh, selected for, selected against, because uh, the, the descendants are already here. So that's a problem for the theory. And also, uh, sometimes it still uh, uh, affects uh, younger people. So people with a higher waste repression are maybe more likely to have some diseases. But it's only going to be associated, for example, with obesity. And uh, obesity, we are really not sure that it was like a disease that was really prevalent in, in, the, in the past. So we are not sure that would be like a good um, uh, theory to explain uh, a selection for men's preferences for low waste rate ratio because that will have little effect, a little impact on their own reproductive success. Um, so yeah, health, it's actually not really a great explanation. We don't have so many data on young non-obese population regarding that. And the data we have is not showing any, any big health issues, but we could I mean, I'm not disregarding it completely. It was that we don't have the data at the moment to, to support this uh, hypothesis. And for fecundity, basically the same thing. We don't have uh, direct evidence that, um, that the difference in waste will ratio in young or youngish women that are not obese uh, will be linked to a difference of fecundity or difference of ability of uh, becoming pregnant. So this one is not great either. Uh, however, you have promising hypotheses. And once again, they're a bit boring, but basically West Repusho is linked to the reproductive potential because it's linked to age and parity and current pregnancy as well. So uh, that is not really uh, difficult to see if you're uh, uh, pregnant, your waste weight pressure will be higher, and uh, waste weight pressure also increases with age. Although that's not the case in all the populations, but in general that's the case. Um, in particular, it will increase with with parity, with an, the number of of uh, pregnancy or children that you had in the past. Uh, that will be the case because your waist is going to be a bit uh, larger. And also your hips uh, and buttocks are going to be a bit smaller with the number of pregnancies and, and, and babies. And so I believe that it's actually a relatively good explanation that will explain the selection of men's preferences for a lower waste weight ratio. Um, but yeah, I guess it's a bit less sexy that something that will be linked to magical hormones and small differences among uh, young nullipar uh, women, if you want. Mm -hmm. is, this, is the value associated with the waste to hip ratio uh, universal? I mean, because I've heard all sorts of different accounts. I've heard people saying that uh, around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, is universally pre preferred by men across different cultures. Other people say that it varies across time and cultures and 
some sometimes people refer to factors like for example socioeconomic status that perhaps some mm. some men prefer lower waste to ratios others higher due to their socioeconomic status and other factors like that so um uh, what do we know about it exactly so yeah there was a lot a lot of debate about that um because yeah, I think at first it was like, oh, great, we found like some universal profound, it's amazing, and it works really well. And then people said, no, I don't find it in this population. Uh, so I think there is indeed some uh, some variation. Uh, the thing is, it's also really linked to the stimuli that people are using. and. I mean, and you can't really use the same stimuli exactly in all populations for different reasons, but just because people have different shapes and bodies in different populations. So if you use the same, it's great because you can compare, but also then one body will make sense in one population and not in the other one. So you have all sorts of complicated issues like that to actually test uh, this uh, hypothesis. But I would say, I think, probably some people won't agree with me, but I think now people kind of agree on the fact that there is overall a, a, a preference for relatively low waste to ratio. So exact value will differ according to the stimuli you're going to use. Also because according to the stimuli you're going to use, it's going to be linked more or less to the body mass index that also varies a lot. Um, but I don't think we have a lot of evidence of populations where they definitely prefer high waste ripple show, meaning like a waste ripple show looking more like a, a male waste ripple show. I don't think we have a, a lot of evidence of that. So yeah, then it's really, some people will take this answer like, a, oh yeah, no, so that's fine, it's universal. And some people will say, oh no, so it's not universal at all. But yeah, it's like some variation, but not that much, I would say. Mm. Yeah, perhaps sometimes people are looking for one single value to see if it's universal or not. And perhaps they say, oh, if it's 0.7 in all cultures and all contexts, then if it's universal. If it's not, if it's 0 0.6, 0 0.8 in different places or something like that, then it's not universal. So perhaps sometimes yeah. the, the debate is about that. Right. Yes, and plus the noise in the measurement and everything, I don't think it's possible to find the exact one value. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's get now into facial features specifically, mm -hmm. because I know that's something you study directly. So in, when it comes to facial features, and we're still talking about uh, women and female attractiveness in this case, uh, what is homogamy? Homogamy, so yeah, so homogamy, so let's start not only for the face, but homogamy is just generally um, the fact of marrying or mating with someone who is similar to you. And so uh, it could be any trait, a social trait, uh, for example, education. Um, and if you talk about a facial feature, it's going to be a face that looks like you or has some... Um, some uh, shared characteristic, for example, the same eye color or something like that. Um, so yeah, so that would be homogamy. And yeah, so homogamy can, can happen for a variety of reasons. So um, that's why we need to be careful with causality here because the, the easiest way to, to explain homogamy for maybe not for facial traits, but for a social um, cultural traits, for example, is just the fact that we're going to meet people every day that look like us, that have the, we meet people at the universities, they have the same um, uh, education that we have, or we meet people that have the same religion that we have, um, same socioeconomic status, uh, and so on. And so if you just meet or mostly meet people uh, that are uh, like you, you're more likely just to end up marrying one that just is like you. And you don't even have to have any preferences uh, in this model. Just it will lead to homogamy just um, automatically. The second one, you can add preferences and you can say maybe all people prefer um, uh, tall people or just attractive people. But because you have competition, 
you will also end up with homogamy because, uh, well, because people with um, high attractiveness or any trait that people are, are, want to, to have in a mate, well, they can um, have their, their preference satisfied and then people who are less attractive will have to end up with people who have not been uh, picked uh, uh, yet. And so here again, you will see homogamy, even though some of them will have their preferences met and, and none of them, and if, even if in, actually everyone prefers the same thing. And the last one is an actual preference for homogamy. And so people who prefer people who look uh, like them. Um, and for facial features, that's actually, uh, yeah, maybe the best explanation because you don't really have this stratification of eye color, for example, between uh, different uh, parts of the society, or I don't think so. Uh, so you're not really more likely to meet people with the same eye color uh, uh, than you have. Uh, and it seems that you don't have a overall preference for one eye color, one specific uh, uh, facial trait. It depends which facial trait we're talking about, of course. So it's possible that preference for traits that are a bit similar to us may happen a little bit for the homogamy in, in faces. That's possible, yes. Oh, I forgot one that is also important, sorry. is the fact that for some traits, if you stay very long with the same person all your life, you may end up looking like them. <laughs> so that's another sort of homogamy, of course. Yeah, but what would be the evolutionary rationale for homogamy here? Because I mean, perhaps what I'm about to say is wrong, but couldn't it, wouldn't it be the case that if you're more similar to someone, then that would point potentially to some sort of genetic relatedness and wouldn't that be an issue? Right. Uh, so yes, of course, if you're too related to a person, uh, you have the risk of um, inbreeding depression and that will uh, cause some issues for your descendants, mo most likely. And that is why we also see like other things like, like the Western market effect, where you're not attracted sexually to people you grew up with and things like that, that like uh, allow you, that's another evolutionary process, protecting you from marrying your, your, your brother or, or your mother. Um, and uh, yes, and some studies when they are looking and when they are creating, for example, composite of faces with a participant, and if it's looking too similar to them, they are not really sexually attracted to, to them either because it's, it's, yeah, it's too similar. And so you have this defense mechanism, I guess, against uh, inbreeding depression. Um, so yes, I guess if it's too close, it's not going to work. Uh, yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, what are the kinds of facial features that men prefer in women? So I like this question. I'm, 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 I'm laughing because I think not you, but some people probably when they ask me this question, they hope that I'm going to tell them like some kind of recipe, like, oh, so you need to have like an eye, which is like three centimeters larger than your mouth and blah, blah, blah. And, and I tell them like, well, the face of a young and healthy person. And so then they look at me and like, why do you have a PhD? <laughs> You're completely useless. <laughs> so yeah, for the exact list, uh, the face is actually quite complicated to analyze, um, especially the, the facial shape. But uh, yeah, for female attractiveness, uh, yeah, indeed, the traits that are um, related to youth and and health. So, yeah, you, if you imagine a person who's young and, <laughs> and healthy, that's that's the face of the person I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. But is that specific to female attractiveness, or is it that females also prefer those traits in men? I mean, if there are differences in terms of what women and men find attractive in the faces of the opposite sex, what would those be? Uh, so the thing is, I I guess I'm, I'm a bit too specialized, but I don't know much about women's preferences. 
Uh, but what I seem to know about is that it's way more messy. So that's maybe why I prefer main preferences because they are a bit easier and you have like cleaner results. Uh, and uh, for women's preferences, it's a bit less clear in part because I think um, it's just that, uh, I think just the main faces are I'm not saying that they are not linked to their reproductive success because I think they are, but in a, probably in, in some ways, but maybe less in a less consistent way. Because, like we said, like for for uh, women's reproductive success, something that is really important is age, uh, because age will matter a lot on your ability to be pregnant and to carry a, a, a baby without any issue. And that's not the case for men. So then you will have to add all these different uh, social cultural factors that might vary way quicker than for female attractiveness, that is a bit more related to the physics and the body. So yes, I think that's why we see a bit this difference. Um, but uh, but yeah, sorry, it was not a really clear answer. <laughs> no, 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 no worries. I was just trying to understand if you knew you about if you knew about it for example there are certain features that seem to be preferred by both males and females like the facial symmetry and uh, healthy skin i mean healthy with no signs of disease or diseases that sometimes manifest on the skin so i mean i was just trying i was just wondering if there would be uh, certain specific features that um, men and women tended to prefer on the opposite sex that, mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, the opposite sex wouldn't really care that much about. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, you're making a really good point about the diseases because uh, in the healthy skin or healthy face, because there's one thing that both sexes will share is trying to avoid pathogens. And mm -hmm. so, yes, uh, mating with someone who is clearly sick is uh, evolutionary not a great idea and so uh, yes that you will expect to see it in in, in both um, sexes for sure um, and uh, yeah like if you take age again I think it's going to matter less uh, for women's preferences and for men's preferences mm -hmm. young age I mean so uh, still about facial attractiveness, I would like to ask you about a very interesting thing that I read in one of your papers. Uh, does paternity uncertainty have anything to do with facial attractiveness? Well, we didn't find anything. <laughs> That's a short answer. Uh, okay, but yeah. what were you what were you trying to explore there? Then? Yeah, so it's uh, it's an all paper and it was kind of a fun hypothesis to test and kind of an example of like yeah you can test any prediction really and uh, it, it's um if you create the, the right design so the theory there are many issues with theory um but the theory was that um it seems that so you have a lot of debate about that because it seems that we used to think that uh, paternity and certainty was really important in humans and for a variety of things uh, in, in, in men uh, when they were going to decide to invest or not in their descendants. And then in the end, we realized that um, the rates of, of, um, of false paternity was not really that high. And so we are starting to wonder if, is it really possible that it's really a, a strong selec selection pressure or not? So. We have some doubts about that, but uh, at the time, we thought that yes, paternity certainty could be quite a strong selective pressure, and uh, and yeah, they, there was some evidence that men do indeed use uh, facial cues in the in the kids to you know to see if they are sure or not that they are their own uh, children and to decide how much to invest in in, in these children. And so the hypothesis we tested was about could could you have an effect even at the mate choice level? Would there be a way to select a mate 
that will allow you to detect this paternity in the descendants. And uh, it was based on the fact that some facial traits are recessive or dominant. So, you know, um, uh, brown eyes are dominant over uh, blue eyes, for example. Um, and so, if you want a really, really uh, simplistic scenario, if uh, the two parents have blue eyes and the baby has brown eyes, eyes it's quite likely that it's not the actual uh, father. The reverse is not working that well. If you do have uh, brown eyes, both of the parents and the baby has blue eyes, it could definitely be their, uh, their descendant because brown is dominant over the blue color. Anyway, the idea was that if you find um, a female mate that has recessive traits, so uh, like blue eyes, it's going to be easier than to detect uh, paternity, paternity uncertainty um, in, the, in the descendant. And we did not find that. We did not find that men preferred uh, recessive traits in, in the face. Um, I mean, I'm not that surprised because, like I said, there were like different issues with uh, with this theory. But uh, it was interesting to test, and we found uh, homogamy like, that we talked about before. So, actually, yes, uh, blue uh, men with blue eyes preferred a bit uh, women with blue eyes, but men with brown eyes preferred a bit uh, women with brown eyes. And we found a few times in some studies. I, I don't know if the effect is really strong, but uh, yeah, we found that a few times. Mm -hmm. So I've already asked you this question for uh, about waist to hip ratio specifically, but uh, when it comes to female attractiveness in general, and here, if you want, you can focus just on facial features or any other kind of trait if you want. Um, does it vary across cultures and times? Um, so... So again, I realized that this question was uh, sometimes mi misleading because, um, yeah, especially in, in general, general public, people thought about beauty standards. And when you talk about beauty standards in general, you include a lot of things, including uh, things that are linked to, to culture, to history, and, and clothes, and, and hairstyle, and makeup, and a lot of things. And, if you include all of that, the answer is really simple. Yeah, it varies a lot, and you have a lot of variation. Um, then if you restrict it again to our really narrow definition of female attractiveness and men preferences for a sexual partner, and you remove the clothes, you remove the hairstyle and everything, you will see less variation um, uh, because you're going to go um, closer to just the a link with a reproductive uh, uh, potential. Um, but yes, you still have some variations and it depends on the feature. And the classical one is the, the body mass index or the, how, the size of the body and that you will see variations uh, uh, across cultures, uh, across time. Um, and um, it seems to be somehow adaptive this variation in preferences so if you are in an environment where um, seeing people are sick because it's actually a, si a cue of sickness then no people are not going to prefer thin uh, bodies really if you are in another population where you have a lot of obesity and uh, the uh, large amount of fat is actually linked to other diseases then people are going to prefer thin people, especially if thin people are also associated with better health and um, higher social status and things like that. So it's, this example is quite nice and relatively intuitive. Uh, then for other traits, it's uh, less, less easy to, to understand or even make predictions, but you will expect some, some variations. Other, for other traits, not really, uh, again, if I go back to my really boring example of age, the relationship between age and uh, reproductive potential in women, that's co completely different for men, but for women, doesn't change that much uh, between cultures. It might change a little bit, but not that much. And so you are not ex you're, we are not expecting to see so much variation between cultures or according to time for 
a cues of age. Yeah. Uh, so would it be correct to say that there are some traits that are more stable across cultures and time and others that vary more? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another question, is there any link between women's attractiveness and uh, expected age at menopause? So, uh, so we, we run a study uh, looking at, at that, at the face of women and, and their expected age at menopause, which we measured with the age at menopause of their own mothers because it's heritable. Uh, age of menopause, and we did indeed find um, a link. I'm, I want to be a bit careful with that because I think another team did not replicate this result, and so it's, it's still preliminary. Um, and to be honest, I was not even sure that I would find this result because I was also thinking that maybe it's more that you have a trade-off between age at menopause and the current uh, fertility and I, I was thinking okay so so maybe men are going to focus on on current fertility disregarding you know age at menopause later and so uh, probably they will still find attractive a woman who is fertile now even though she has an earlier age at menopause but we found the opposite we found a a, a small preference for um for women with a, a, an age at menopause a predicted age at menopause a bit later in life which you could also explain because uh, you will think that for long-term relationship, not for short term, but for long-term relationship, if you're expecting to stay all your life with this partner, which you have a longer period to, uh, to reproduce if, uh, if your partner has an age at menopause later. But yeah, it's, it's really pre preliminary because yeah, I want to know more about the trade-off between, uh, between age and menopause and Current fertility and parity and all these things, um, but yes, and age at menopause itself or menopause itself, it's just fascinating because, as you know, it's like an evolutionary puzzle. We don't really understand why women would stop reproducing before the end of their lives, and so you have many different explanations, uh, hypotheses, uh, including the grandmother hypothesis, and uh, yes, and basically, if you start looking at men's preferences for age at menopause, is adding sexual selection into the, to the pot, which is already quite complex. And uh, yeah, so that's, that, that, uh, that was uh, the idea, but to be continued, I would say. Yeah, but then there's the possibility that fe uh, female attractiveness might give some cues about uh, their expected age at menopause. Yeah, that's, that's a possibility. I have no idea what would be this cues, uh, to be honest. Uh, in this little study that we ran, we looked at a few uh, facial traits, but we were also a bit limited with a, with a sample size. Uh, so yeah, we couldn't find anything that really uh, was indeed related to age and menopause. The only thing, it was something with attractiveness and men's preferences, but I, I don't know exactly what it was. So, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not totally impossible that you will have uh, some something that will uh, appear even in in the face yeah yeah mm -hmm. so for the last topic of our conversation i would like to talk about parent offspring conflict and particularly when it comes to mate choice so where does this stem from so yeah parent offspring conflict again a really classical topic in evolutionary biology, which, uh, which I like. And it's really, because when you think of first, you think about it uh, really quickly, you're like, no, why would parent and often really conflict on anything? Because they're all working on the reproduction of their lineage, but actually not really because um, the, the parents have to divide their investment between different children, even if it's potential future children, even if that's the first one they have right now, they maybe don't want to invest all their resources in this specific uh, kid and they want to have maybe other ones later on. And the offspring, even though he will maybe, he will be related 
uh, genetically to other brothers and sisters, he's more related to himself or herself, and he would like to get all the investment from the parents. So you have a conflict starting. So that's a, a really simplistic explanation of the parent of spring conflict. And regarding mate choice, so it's interesting because uh, if you don't have any trade-off to make, if you could find the perfect mate, so I don't know, with uh, really good health, uh, really uh, a lot of resources, uh, really faithful and kind and everything, there is really no reason why uh, the parents and the offspring will have different opinion and they will choose the, the same the same mate. But as we know, you have competition and you have a variety of different mates of different uh, quality. And really often you have to trade off different traits and you can't have the most beautiful mate, but maybe you can have a, a, a richer mate or things like that. So when you have to trade off different qualities, that's where maybe parents and offspring might disagree. Um, and, uh, and the basic idea is that parents should focus a little bit more on resources because that's something they can indeed share for the whole family. Uh, or at least if the new mate coming to the family has some resources, they don't have to invest so many of their own resources in these uh, children and they could keep their resources to invest other children. Um, and what we, that all the other qualities that are more related to, um, to either genetic quality or health and so just the number of uh, children that they can produce, for example, like just fertility, it should be a bit more important to the offspring uh, in theory. And so we looked at that. It was actually really interesting because instead of just sending a, a survey to to my students and their parents, we actually went to China where we found a, um, a marriage market where the, the parents are actively looking for uh, a maid for their children. Um, they are not going to tell them you have to, to marry this person. They're just helping their, uh, their adult uh, children to find a mate. Uh, because according to these parents, the, the offspring are struggling to find a mate, or they are too shy, apparently, to, to find a mate. Uh, and so they go on this kind of market on, in a park, and they advertise the quality of their uh, own offspring, and they look at other um, uh, advertisement about uh, other uh, individuals, and they try to find a, a partner. So we went there, and we um, had a little experiment and trying to look at different trade-offs and showing to these parents different profiles of, um, of, uh, of potential partners and see uh, what they would think. And then we look also at the preferences of, of, of young adults for themselves. And what we found is that when uh, you, we couldn't find a, um, a big conflict between parents and sons, but we found some kind of conflict between the parents and the daughter. And that's something that I've been found in other places as well. So more conflict in case of sons. That's very interesting. So why is that? Do you have any idea? Do you have any idea why there tends to be, at least in that specific study, you did more conflict between parents and sons than between parents? So, and sorry, what did I say? I, want to, I said more conflict when, when you have a daughter. I, I'm so sorry oh, if I said that. Oh, uh, no, no uh, perhaps, perhaps it was me who <laughs> so, said it wrong. I, no, no so, so both the parents and the sons, sorry, uh, all wanted uh, a, an attractive mate. They didn't care about the income, for example. That's how we manipulated the resource. They didn't care about the income of the, of the woman de uh, depicted in the, in the profile. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when the parents were looking for a, a male partner. Uh, they cared a lot about the income. They didn't care at all about the attractiveness. But the daughters, the young women, they cared more about the attractiveness uh, compared to their parents or the parents. Um, we also found something 
bit weird that I was not expecting that the parents did not like our profile with a really attractive and rich uh, male partner. And I was not expecting that because I was like, there is no trade-off. Just take it. It's perfect. You can have resources and health and genetic quality or whatever attractiveness is a cure of in this case. And so I think my only uh, preliminary explanation could be that it's uh, trying to avoid a risk of divorce or like that the, the, the man is going to leave. And so like, you know, it's too good to be true. And so that did, didn't bother the young woman, but it seems to bother the, the parents. So that's something interesting to explore a bit further, I think. Mm -hmm. And do you have any idea if that links to other study, other similar studies that have, have been done in other cultures? Do you think that those that kind of conflict conflict could tend to be universal um i should know but it's been, it's been a while now it's, i've not been working on part of spring conflict for a while now uh but uh from what i can remember at the time is that it was not quite different from other studies and it was quite concordant so i think that might be something we find in other places um as well uh, but uh, yeah, probably new studies that appeared since then that I missed. <laughs> Sorry. No, no problem at all. Uh, so just on the last question. So just to perhaps sum it up a little bit, is it then that when there's parent offspring conflict over mate choice, it stems from the fact that perhaps uh, parents are looking more toward uh, someone who can perhaps benefit the family in general and their offspring are looking for someone who goes along their preferences and benefits them specifically. Is that, is that it or is that not exactly the correct way? Of no, no, I think that's, uh, that's it. That's, that's basically the theory and also most of the evidence we have. Also, uh, it's also my understanding that in the end, there is less conflict than we thought there would be. Like, uh, because you also have to take into account what is possible. Because you know, we are talking about like uh, preferencing in an ideal world, and so maybe then you might see a bit um, files, and you really show the different trade-off in a really specific way, and we do that to show, to see uh, and put in evidence any conflict, but it's also possible that in real life with the actual potential uh, partners that are available uh, and also, yeah, and so that in the end, maybe the, the choices of the parents and the offspring do not differ that much in the end. And also you have like all the psychological traits like candidates and things like that, that I think everybody likes the same. So yes, if you look, for, for finals, you will find a conflict, but uh, I'm not sure it happens all the time and that it's a really conflictual matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I would imagine that if there are specific preferences for that males and females have for partners of the opposite sex, then probably the parents and their offspring would share most of those preferences. Yes, I think that most would of them be. Are that would be relevant from an evolutionary perspective. Yes, yes, I believe so. Once it's only in some cases where you will have a, a, a trade-off to make, and they will have a choice to make, and with a lot of different between resources and genetic quality, maybe you will have a conflict. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Dr. Bove, uh, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, just, I guess, my name uh, and Northumbria University and you will find the university website with, with my page or on Google Scholar. So you will find the information that is relevant. Okay, great. So thank you so much again for thank taking you. the time to come on the show and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this episode until the end. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and consider making a pledge there 
starting at $1 per month. You also have links to PayPal. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Nlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at nlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzka and Blanchett Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans, Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Vissel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bird Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Varen, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingarder, Becca Newberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegar, Rui Nassi, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, o Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurban, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguenzo, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreff, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Unig, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linares, Lida Cosmidi, Simon Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzka, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackleford, and Sunny Smith. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stefaniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nun Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.